go. We're live. Uh, it's a research in Manoa. We are so excited to have Don Thomas on the show. <clears throat> he's an old friend and an old guest, and he's uh, a research professor at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, which is part of the School of Ocean Earth Science uh, and, uh, at Manoa. Uh, yes. However, Don has been all over the state. Yes. I mean, there's no corner of the state which he hasn't researched. Right. Well, although my focus has been uh, dominantly uh, work on Hawaii Island, and that's, uh, I have an office there that I work out of. And he's a volcanologist. Yes, my, my specialty is volcanology, but that covers a multitude of sins. And uh, I've done uh, research work on everything from the gas discharges of Kilauea to uh, groundwater supply uh, in the Kilauea East Rift Zone. So that's why we can talk about different things at different times with right. Don. And the title of our show is uh, Amazing Freshwater Discoveries in Hawaii really, really important. I didn't know about this until 10 minutes ago, and it came up at the Science, uh, the science Cafe in Kano yes. Key a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, right. and we are lucky to have Don here to tell us about it. It's an EBSCOR project. Don, what's going on? Okay, thank you for the opportunity, and um, really what I, uh, what I wanted to do was, was summarize uh, really a, a, a long, uh, sequence of, of research that I've been involved in here, on, or not here on Oahu, but actually on the Big Island, and talk a bit about the implications uh, for Oahu and for the other islands. Um, basically, my, my specialty started out in uh, volcanology and, and uh, did a lot of work on, on geothermal resources. But uh, with time, I became involved in a project in uh, Hilo, uh, very close, it was, um, a research project to try to document the history of a Hawaiian-style volcano. And this was a bit unique in that our documentation was not to cover the surface, but actually go into the interior of Mauna Kea and try to uh, understand its history, how the eruption cycle had changed over time, going back uh, as far into the history of the volcano as we could. And so we drilled a borehole uh, down near the shoreline, uh, and it turns out the shoreline was, was Mauna Loa, uh, Mauna Loa rocks, but we, we drilled through Mauna Loa where it's encroaching onto Mauna Kea and uh, drilled 11,540 feet into Mauna Kea while we continuously sampled the rocks. So we have basically samples of every rock or every lava flow that Mauna Kea has Two produced. Miles. Of, More of than history, two miles yeah. uh, back into the history. We think in terms of time, we're, we were back about uh, 600 to 700,000 years into the history of, of Mauna Kea. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and when we started, uh, actually, I was, I was kind of a a member of the of the research team more by convenience I describe my role as the mechanic because I actually knew what a drill rig looked like <laughs> and so I managed the drilling and my interest was uh, the groundwater but when we started the project uh, it was not too it didn't look too exciting uh, we figured that well we were just going to drill through a few tens of feet of fresh water and then be into saltwater saturated rocks uh, below what we know is the, uh, most people are maybe familiar with as the basal freshwater lens. And down near the shoreline, we figured we'd drill through 50 feet of that, and then we'd be in salt water, and nothing much interesting would happen from there. And because usually when you hit salt water, that's the end of it. That's it. That's no basically all the water. There's no, no fresh water below that. And that model, I mean, we, we've been using that model now for about 75 years in Hawaii. Actually, some very good scientists back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, Harold Stearns, Gordon McDonald, uh, working for the were, plantations. They were, they were, well, they were working uh, for Geological Survey Territory of Hawaii. Ultimately, uh, Dr. McDonald uh, became a, a professor at the University of Hawaii, and actually, I was one of the, the fortunate few uh, still around that actually took classes with Gordon. Uh, I uh, took I, probably the next to the last. Uh, uh, sequence of courses that he presented at the university before his passing. But uh, uh, they did some brilliant work back in the 30s and 40s, and they developed a model for groundwater that said, well, okay, the, the groundwater is, is going to collect inside the island from rainfall, 
And as you drill wells, as you move inland, the, the elevation of the water table is going to rise only about a foot per mile. And the, the bottom of that freshwater system is only going to be, uh, you know, going downward at, at a few tens of feet per mile inland. And so based on that, we were within a kilometer of the shoreline. We figured, well, we drill through a, you know, a few feet of fresh water and then be in salt water. Uh, well, it, it turned out that um, as, as we drilled down, and we were collecting rocks, rock samples all the way down, uh, we hit the transition from Mauna Loa into Mauna Kea. And it turns out there were a bunch of soil and ash layers there. And below that, the soil and ash layers, was more fresh water. More fresh water. More fresh Remarkable water. Remarkable discovery. It was, it was very exciting and actually exciting in a couple of different ways because it was fresh water that was under artesian pressure. Now this is one of the things that we knew when we started the project, there was no artesian water on the big island. Except when we drilled into this fresh water layer, the well began producing about 2,000 gallons a minute of fresh water. Uh, that would have been fine, except we were down in an old quarry and it just about flooded out our drill rig. <laughs> well. So it was, it was quite exciting. Um, but that, that layer of fresh water was about 400 feet thick and it wasn't fossil water. Uh, we, we were able to determine its age and we were able to determine where it came from on Mauna Kea. And we know it was on Mauna Kea because it was below that transition from Mauna Loa to Mauna Kea. It's potable water. And it's potable water, and wonderful water. We actually let it flow for a while. That's where we got our drinking water for a while. Interesting. Um, but uh, the, the water came from an elevation of about 7,000 feet on Mauna Kea. And the age of the above water, sea level. above sea level. In the mountain. In the mountain. That's halfway up the mountain. Halfway up the mountain. And it took about 2,000 years to get from where it hit the ground down to where we drilled into it in Hilo. We were able to determine the age of that water at about 2,000 years. And we estimated that, because uh, we don't really know how, how wide that aquifer is, it, it was about 400 feet thick. And based on the rate of flow though, we're estimating it's about 200 million gallons a day of fresh water is flowing through that system and actually discharging as deep submarine freshwater springs. Under artesian pressure. Under artesian pressure. So oh, This is um, a real dis major discovery well, in water. It, it was a very significant discovery for us. I mean, this was the first time we'd ever seen artesian water on the Big Island, and the first time we'd ever seen that kind of a volume of freshwater below sea level. Uh -huh. So that was quite exciting. Yeah. But eventually we had to continue drilling. It gets better. It, it gets, gets better. It gets it way gets, better. Gets, it's, you know, this was, this was kind of, <laughs> The kind of the the enticement to to think differently about groundwater, and we continued drilling, and uh, we drilled through some more rocks that were actually uh, quite dense. They were very compacted, and didn't have any fractures in them at all, for about 4,000 feet. Then we hit some rocks that were fractured, and we found more fresh water. A whole and new layer. A whole new layer of fresh water. And actually, we went through multiple layers because the, the type of rock that we encountered, it, it's referred to as pillow lavas. These are lavas that have been actually erupted below sea level. And they're, they're fairly solid, but they are also fractured. And the fractures were open. And when we allowed the, the water to flow from the well, we found fresh water being produced. Again, potable. Again, potable. And we continued, uh, continued drilling. We actually set a string of casing into the hole down to a depth of about 9,900 feet. And once and we got it in place, we allowed the well to flow and it was still flowing fresh water from about 10,000 feet. I got an interesting picture that uh, I'd like to show. Uh, this would be slide number 20. Mm -hmm. uh, because that water, um, was also artesian and this is a picture taken <coughs> on the rig floor these are a couple of our drill hands they the piece of pipe sticking up is part of the drill pipe and they've just disconnected our our uh, driving mechanism to do the drilling and you can see water spouting out of the hole in fact uh, when we shut that water in and put a pressure gauge on it, we were seeing pressures of as much as 160 pounds per square inch. Wow. So very high pressures down there. And 
get, this was the first time anybody had, no, certainly no one had conjectured that there would be fresh water at those depths when we started the project. So right there, you had a source of fresh water that's coming off of its own power, the artesian yes. power, <clears throat> and you could, you could send it anywhere in the Big Island, actually. You, well, you could pretty much send it anywhere, but the, the most important thing, though, and a, a lot of people ask, well, gee, you know, could you develop that water? You can, but it, it, I guess the, the, the appropriate cliche is that it's, it, for Hilo, it's kind of bringing coals to Newcastle. <laughs> okay. Because Hilo has plenty of fresh groundwater, yeah. but the important, one of the important implications of that deep fresh water was that it told us that inside of Mauna Kea, at much high, fresh groundwater had to have accumulated at much higher elevations inside the volcano than the old Stearns and McDonald had projected. And so that was telling us that, okay, yeah. we're seeing water collecting inside the mountain at much higher rates than we ever realized. So this, <clears throat> this discovery at what, 9,000 feet, the yeah. second layer That's or multiple deep, layers, deep, deep, deep layers, deep yeah. fresh water under artesian pressure led you to begin an inquiry up over sea level, yes. up the mountain. Yes. And right after this break, Don Thomas, we're going to find out what you discovered halfway up the mountain. Wow, okay. it gets really interesting now. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at KauiLucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman, welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Bingo, we're back, Bingo, we're back with Don Thomas, uh, a, uh, a research uh, a professor at HIGP. We're talking about water, which is an offshoot from his volcanology, you know, science, <coughs> and discovery um, on, was it Mauna Kea? Mauna Kea, yes. So yeah. what did you find? Okay, so uh, there were a number of people that took an interest in this very deep water, and, and a few of them realized that it meant that, you know, this, uh, that fresh water was accumulating at high elevations inside of Mauna Kea. And so they asked me if I would be willing to, to do a, a couple of test holes up in the saddle region. And again, uh, part of the, really the, the valuable science that comes out of the type of drilling we're doing, as I say, we're collecting a continuous sequence of rocks. And so in part, we're drilling for water. We want to know where the water is, but because we're also collecting samples of the geology, we can say why it's there. And this is different than regular water drilling. Regular water well drilling, they just want to grind up the rocks and get them out of there because what they're interested in is the hole in the water. And what I'm interested in is the hole and the water in the rock, because that rock will then tell us, okay, is this, uh, what's special about this area that we have water present here? And then when you learn that, you can apply that knowledge to exactly. other locations and find similar phenomena. Exactly, exactly. And so what we, uh, what we did is, is near the middle of the saddle, uh, in actually one of the driest areas in the state. Uh, we, we had done, uh, and we talked about this in an earlier show, we had done uh, a process, uh, a, a survey called magnetotellurics, and we can look down into the ground and measure the electrical conductivity. And wet rocks are more conductive than dry rocks. And so based on the results of that survey, we identified a location near the center of the saddle that indicated that there were, there were conductive rocks fairly close to the surface. And that we selected as our, our most likely location to find high level water within the saddle. And so we drilled there and the elevation was about 6,400 feet above sea level. And we actually encountered a layer of fresh water at a depth of only 700 feet. So that's 5,700 feet above sea level. No one was, was predicting that we would see water nobody there. Nobody knew it was there? No, nobody had any idea and that there was water. this is in that very dry area there. Yes. The saddle is pretty dry. Yes. Oh, yes. Very dry. It is one of the lowest rainfall areas in the state. 
and um, we, we, we hit a, a saturated zone at 700 feet depth, 5,700 feet. It continued for about 500 feet. So it wasn't, you know, just a, a, you know, a drop in the bucket, so to speak. Uh, 500 foot thick aquifer of continuous saturation. And then again, because we were collecting core, uh, as we got towards the bottom of that layer of water, we actually encountered a layer of very clay rich ash. And when we drilled through it, no more water. So we, this layer of clay and ash was, act, was actually serving kind of as a basin, as a, what we call a perching formation. So rainfall, and we were able to determine that the rainfall that, was, or the, that produced that water occurs at about 9,000 feet above sea level. Um, so above the, the middle of the cell. It comes cell. down. It uh, comes down. It both infiltrates. Sides of the, of the, uh, well, it probably comes down mostly from the slope of Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. it, it infiltrates, but then it's intercepted by that basin and is, is basically being caught there. And probably it continues to flow sort of further down to the south from, from where we encounter it. But it's not it. a lot of permeation. Uh, but it, it, well, it's, it, most of the rock is very permeable, but this one layer is actually what's controlling the flow. Got it. So when we drilled through that layer, we were back into dry rock. Uh, but only for about another 600 feet, and then we found another layer of fresh water. And so that layer was standing at about 4,600 feet above sea level, and it was continuous from there down almost to sea level uh, where we stopped drilling. We actually didn't quite get to sea level in this, in this borehole, but continuous saturation. And so it looks like there's a huge reservoir of fresh water that's contained within the saddle. Never tapped before. Never tapped before. Never, never, even never known, known before. Never known before. And what so the magic was to figure out, to sort of triangulate from a geological point of view that it was probably up there. Right. Well, in part it was the geophysics. In part it was the prior findings that we made down in Hilo. Mm -hmm. it, you know, those gave us some hints, and we, we just followed them up with some good science. But nobody say, knew before. Nobody had known about it before. And so, again, very uh, unique findings. And because we were collecting rock samples, we, we can actually describe this reservoir. And, and we've known about these types of reservoirs in other locations, but we didn't know it existed here. It's, it's called a dike impounded aquifer. And it may encompass an area of maybe 400 square miles or 400 square kilometers up there within the saddle. We believe it's, it's based on the, the geophysical work that it's, that it's quite large. Um, How important is this? It sounds like, you know, ultimately Hawaii is going to have, already has a problem with water. This sounds like it could solve the problem. So, well, you know, how does it change things for us in, in our daily water use and water finding? Well, I think uh, the main thing that it tells us, and, and, and really the, the important take-home message is that geology ha exerts a much greater control over groundwater flow and groundwater storage than we really ever known before. Now again, Stearns and McDonald did an amazing bit of work, but you know, we've, we've gained a lot since then. We've gained new techniques, new technology that allow us to, to go in and do investigations that they couldn't have done back then. And now that we're seeing these things that, that you know, are out there, we're finding that, okay, this is not uncommon. And we're, we're seeing situations in the Keho Aquifer where we have these impounded bodies of water. And prior to, and it wasn't, I certainly had nothing to do with the discovery of this impounded water, the so-called high level water. But prior to that, the, the assumption was that there just wasn't any water in, in Kailua Kona area. It was a very, very small amount of water. But it turns out that we've got a, what is in, on one hand, a perching formation is also an impounding formation. So it's telling us that, that the ge we, we really do need to understand the geology in a lot more detail than we do now to understand how groundwater moves. And, you know, and this, to, is, this is, these are lessons. This is a lesson that we didn't know before, that we now know. It's uh, with certain geological discoveries in, in the process, the way geology works here in these islands. That will have an effect on every island, am I right? Every, every island. island. And well, every island has got geology, and, and it really is the geologic history of the island that controls the water flow. And, and really, to bring the story home to Oahu, 
we, we understand maybe 10% of the geology of Oahu. We have, what, over a million people on this island. We are critically dependent on the groundwater resources that we have here. And there is just a tremendous amount that we don't understand about groundwater flow. As we talked about before the, the show started, uh, the controversy over the Red Hill and the, and the release of some fuel there, uh, we don't even know anything as basic as, as okay, which direction is the water flow mm. moving in this area? I mean, that's critically important to know how much of a threat either that spill or a future spill would present. And so in part because of these findings, of finding really that, that the, the groundwater system is much more complex, than we, we had ever realized. Uh, we, had, we're, we submitted a proposal about a year and a half ago now to National Science Foundation to, that we proposed actually to undertake really a new evaluation of the groundwater system and in Hawaii and to start actually with the Pearl Harbor Aquifer and the Keho Aquifer on the Big Island. Uh, we were not gonna be able to do them all at once. Uh, we selected the Keho Aquifer in part because there's some interesting things going on there. Uh, there is a bit of a dispute going on over how the water is being used there. Mm -hmm. And likewise here on Oahu. But the Keho Aquifer is a young volcanic system. Oahu is much, much older. We know that as, as the islands age, things change. So we, we, we're, we selected these to have a, a spectrum of geologic conditions to deal with and to, to try to, to lend some, some new data into understanding how the groundwater system works on Oahu. And that understanding is going to change the way we see water, the way we use water. Uh, it's going to change, you know, up till now we, <clears throat> we've worried about the possibility we'll need to do uh, um, uh, desalination, desalination and, that kind of thing, yeah. and uh, these bladders out in the ocean right. and all these very expensive high-tech things right. Now it appears from this, this research that we may not have to do that anymore. We may have a really fine supply out there, but what are the challenges? I mean, one of the, one of the things I'm concerned with, and I'm sure you are, is um, mismanaging this fantastic new resource. Well, it's, it's not so much mismanaging, but not optimizing the management. And the, the, again, I'm not, uh, by no means I'm criticizing the Commission on Water Resources Management. They do the best they can with the information that they have. But we can, at the university, produce more information, give them better information with which to monitor the resources. If we can go out and, and, and develop more details on the geology, define how the water is moving within the island, we can help them optimize how we develop the resource. We, we know that certainly as the population on this island increases, the demand on the, the groundwater system is, is going to continually increase. And also with the increased population, you have increased potential for contamination. And so we need to be able to develop the information on the existing groundwater system that will allow us to manage it better both sort of in the immediate term, when somebody wants to drill a well or when we need water in a particular location, we can identify where the optimum place is to, to drill that well, but... So we don't lose the water. Well, so we don't, we don't and, and we damage don't the aquifer. We don't damage right, the aquifer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can overdraw an aquifer and, and basically draw seawater into it that will then take a, a long period of time to dissipate. And so we don't want to do that. But I think equally important, and we're, we're not looking at, at over the next decade, we're ne looking over the next 10 decades, because we, we can reasonably anticipate that the climate is gonna change. Now, we don't know whether it's gonna increase rainfall or decrease it, but if we understand the groundwater aquifer on the island well enough and have good enough models, we can then project what the effect of a range of climate change possibilities are and then see how best to manage the resource in anticipation of sort of the average case or the worst case or the best case. And so we can make better decisions on how we develop that water supply. This is incredible. It means that potentially, if we do it right, uh, over, over time, we'll be able to supply the entire population of Oahu with this potable water from all islands. 
as an incredible possibility given the risks and dangers that yes. we thought we had before. Yes. And yes, then very, it gets better definitely. from that, too. It gets better from that. You know, at Nelha, and you and I sat right. together on the board at Nelha, yes. they had this deep sea pipe, and they were able to draw this, uh, you know, this high quality water out of right. deep, the depths of the ocean and then process it into uh, desalinated right. water. Drinking water. And right. then sell that in, to Asia at a, at a significant profit. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now so we have a new source of water. What do you think about that? Well, certainly there's potential there. Uh, there, there in many countries. I mean, I think honestly we don't adequately appreciate the quality of the water that we have here in Hawaii. It's some of the best in the world, and you have huge populations in China. You have populations in, in Southeast Asia and Japan that can only hope for water as good a quality as we have, and there is strong interest in bottled water. And again, if we can develop a method of harvesting that water. In my opinion, we harvest it before we lose it to the ocean. So it doesn't impact the supply, the reserve that we have, then that could be a, a very interesting new industry for Fabulous. Hawaii. The, the, the power of geology, if I can say that, well, well, and, the, and the power of the University of Hawaii doing at least part of its mission by, by doing research that has a direct effect on our lives in these islands. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that really, to me, in a, a land-grant university that's supported by the taxpayers, this is the kind of thing that we, we should be doing and, and really should be focusing on. I mean, it, I think it's incredibly important to the residents of Hawaii, and it really is a way for us to justify our existence and our research program at the university. Don, thank you for coming down. My pleasure. And thank you for all the stuff, and thank you for saving us. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's, I'm not sure I can I can save anybody. We'll check less back myself. with you. Okay. Check. And we'll see later on. Right. Check back with me in a hundred years, and, and we'll know how how effective I've been. Don Thomas, research thank you. professor at HIGP, and so on. My pleasure. So Thanks very much for the opportunity. Aloha. <laughs>